All right, so I guess uh, we're more or less there. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, host uh, Professor Shoup, um, whom the Wall Street Journal called the uh, rock star of parking. He has a wonderful book that's called The High Cost of Free Parking. Um, it's an, it's a, I, I think in, in, in transportation, uh, in urban planning, there are a lot of very interesting lessons uh, that one can, can get from this book. Uh, and there's a number of municipalities across the world that are implementing some of the solutions that are uh, are given there. So this is a uh, this is a talk that I think has extreme relevance uh, uh, for us. Uh, before the word Kiev used to be plagued by uh, intense traffic and very long queues and insufficient parking spots in the center and around uh, around residential areas. So we will um, have a presentation for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we will take, uh, uh, I'll just, you know, maybe have a, a few questions uh, uh, to Donald, and uh, your comments and questions are welcome in the Q&A. Donald, the screen is yours. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I uh, greatly admire how bravely Ukraine is defending itself in the war. And uh, I hope I can contribute something of value in helping you to reconstruct your cities after the war ends. Um, I, I realize that uh, parking must seem like a, a minor issue at this point in your nation's history. And you probably don't feel that you need someone from Los Angeles to advise you about city planning. Um, from what I see on television, your cities look more like Paris than Los Angeles. Um, but Los Angeles has made so many mistakes in, in its parking policies and in its planning policies that we, we have now focused on how to solve uh, all the problems that our bad planning has created. And I believe some of these ideas will help you in reconstructing your own cities. Well, parking spaces use up uh, a lot of land or cost a lot of money or both. Um, they also encourage people to buy cars and use cars, which also cost a lot of money. Uh, and when money for reconstruction is scarce, cities should spend most of that money on housing for people, not on housing for cars. I think uh, cities have made three grave mistakes in their parking policies. Uh, first is to keep curb parking free or cheap. Uh, everybody wants to park free, including you and me, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should uh, organize our cities around free parking. Uh, that has caused a, 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 a terrific problem. Uh, and second, I think uh, I'll come to this later, is that they don't use the revenue from curb parking properly. They don't use the revenue in a way that makes people understand that it's wise to charge the right price for curb parking. And third, they require uh, all buildings to provide ample off-street parking. Uh, that if the curb parking is scarce and hard to find, it seems natural that uh, new buildings should have off-street parking, <clears throat> but the requirements to charge for off-street parking have created a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. Um, well, uh, I have uh, the three basic ideas that, uh, that I would like to talk about today. And one is uh, uh, a simple statement, who could object to charging the right prices for curb parking? Um, it sounds like a tautology. Um, that, but by what I mean by the right price is, is the lowest price uh, that will leave one or two open spaces on every block. Um, that you price the spaces uh, so that the supply um, and demand are at equilibrium that whenever anybody arrives at a destination in a car, they will see what they want to see, which is what are the two open spaces waiting for them. Um, and then because of that, uh, most of the spaces will be occupied uh, and, and 
but they'll also be readily available. And I don't think you could get a better situation that the curb spaces are delivering people to the stores, to the shops, to the uh, universities, to whatever the destination is, that the, the, the curb spaces will be uh, providing as much access as possible. And then uh, this is, I'll spend more time on this, is to establish uh, parking benefit districts uh, that use the parking meter revenue to pay for public services that uh, people can see as soon as they get out of their car, they'll see clean sidewalks, they'll see healthy street trees, they'll see no graffiti. Uh, some cities give um, uh, free transit passes to everybody who lives or works on the metered streets or gives free Wi-Fi to everybody on the metered street. If you could use the money to show people that the parking revenue is benefits them, then they will understand that maybe we should charge the right price for curb parking. Be politically popular. Uh, uh, and then if you do those two, you could remove off-street parking requirements that uh, there's no reason to tell a, a new uh, a restaurant that it has to have uh, 10 parking spaces for every 100 square meters of the restaurant uh, before it can open. Uh, that uh, there's always enough uh, space on the street that's available and restaurants or anything else can provide as much parking as they think their customers want. Um, and this, this freedom from parking requirements uh, will, uh, it will benefit the, 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 the block of the cities uh, and the economy and the environment. Well, uh, I'll talk first about these demand-based prices for curb parking. Um, they'll, they'll have to be different at different times of the day at different different locations because the demand is different. Um, the most, most blocks, at least in the United States, have eight or 10 curb parking spaces uh, on every street front. Um, and uh, the, uh, the demand is, is much higher in downtown and much lower out, uh, out of the suburbs. And in many places, the, the, the right price will be low, it will, will be zero because even when it's free, there, there are open spaces. But where they're all occupied, where there's a crowded curb parking, then they have to, the prices have to go up and they have to vary by time of day if demand differ, differs by time of day. Uh, and one of the ways of saying is about 85% of the spaces should be occupied almost all of the time and 15% of them should be vacant uh, to provide access for people who are newly arriving. Um, um, and so that everybody can see uh, when they're driving, when they're walking, <laughs> when they're hunting for parking, they can see that curb spaces are, are, are not hard to find. Uh, it's hard to find a block where there is no uh, open curb space. And this will have the big effect of uh, meaning that people won't drive around hunting for parking. They'll never have to circle the block several times before they find somebody leaving. Um, now that means that uh, we have to have beaters that can adjust uh, to different prices at different times. Um, and you have to have occupancy sensing to, so that the city will know what is the, uh, what is the occupancy. Uh, but the prices are communicated to the beaters uh, electronically. They don't have to, nobody has to touch the parking beaters um, to change the prices. And, Avoiding cruising for parking is, is really key. Here's a, a, the results of 25 studies of cruising for parking in 17 cities on four continents over uh, close to 100, the past 100 years. Uh, appropriately, the first two studies were done in Detroit. Um, and uh, that they studied how, how what share of the traffic was cruising for parking. And we'll, I'll get into later that all that is how you determine it, but uh, between 20% and a third of the, the cars were hunting for parking. 
uh, and if when you uh, take the average of all these cities, uh, and these are the downtown areas where where where, where all the spaces are, are, are occupied and the traffic is congested, about 32% of the cars were cruising for parking and it took about eight minutes to find a space. Um, the, uh, now this is very selective. It doesn't mean that all 32% of all traffic is cruising. It just means in crowded areas where, where the, all the occupied, all the spaces are occupied, that is bound to be people hunting for a curb space if the curb space is free or if it's underpriced. Um, here was a study done in Chicago uh, where they, uh, they uh, uh, hired uh, students to stand at uh, every intersection with very uh, accurate watches and they noted the license plate of every car that came to that corner and they whether it turned left or right or straight ahead at exactly the time so they could recreate the path of travel uh, among all these uh, uh, intersections and say of the uh, lower right people were always looking for something new it'll be it'll be better on the next block uh, people on the left were just fixated on parking on the same block they just kept circling the block but who knows what the normal strategy is? What do you do when you're hunting for curb parking? But you know, it does seem unfair as a way to allocate curb parking spaces. Um, you have to work so hard to find a space. It seems to be that you see, you, you want to uh, not follow closely behind somebody else who appears to be cruising because they'll take the curb space uh, that you want. Um, and your rear view mirror, you often see somebody getting your, your space. Uh, it just doesn't seem fair, and at least a very uh, dangerous behavior that uh, the drivers are not looking out for pedestrians or bicyclists. And if they see a, an open space on the other side of the street, uh, they'll make a U-turn in the middle of traffic, which often causes accidents. Uh, here's a grainy footage of, of a very bold behavior. I was able to speak to the driver after she got out of the car and she said, well, I always take, do whatever it takes to, to find a, a free curb parking space. Uh, um, well, San Francisco is the first city uh, to have taken the, this advice I, I'm giving. Um, they had a grant from the US federal government to buy all new parking meters that uh, that were uh, electronic and uh, they charge different prices at different times of day and they installed sensors in the uh, in the pavement and they also uh, produced a video showing how they hoped the thing would work and I think this is the, the smartest thing when you're trying to uh, convince people to do something or that something is the right idea that you get a good video
Um, well, this program has been running for um, about 10 years now. And one of the amazing things to me is that the average price of parking declined uh, because if the, as it was previously uh, true, the, the, they had the same price all day long, it's going to be too high at some times and too low at others. And it was too high in the morning. Many meters um, in, in San Francisco, uh, after uh, three years, we're down to 25 cents an hour in the morning. Some of them went up to six, $6 an hour uh, in the afternoon in the busiest areas, but on average, the prices declined by 1% of all prices, which means essentially they were the same. They just were distributed that some prices went up and some prices went down. And they also have a nice graphic showing what is the problem uh, now as the, the upper block that all the spaces are occupied. And on the lower block, there are uh, more than enough open spaces. So what they would do, they would nudge up the price of the top block and nudge down the price of the lower block until they get what is the ideal uh, occupancy. Um, now, many people seem to think that charging uh, fair market prices for curb parking would require a wrenching social change, almost as cataclysmic as the Reformation. Um, but it's a really a very small change. Um, I mean, if the city can't even do that, what can the city do? How competent is the city? How can you trust them if they can't even get the price of curb parking right? Why should you <laughs> think that they, that, they, that they know exactly what's right with, uh, with, with everything else? It's, it's just simply like uh, the, the, the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. When you're a children, you learn that parking shouldn't be too hot or too cold. Well, parking prices shouldn't be too low or too high. Um, um, here's a, uh, an example also at, on the UCLA campus. I teach at the University of California in Los Angeles. And, and on our campus, we have 23,000 uh, parking spaces, almost the uh, more than almost any other uh, campus on earth. And here's one of the new uh, uh, parking meters that it, it uh, takes credit cards. Uh, it, uh, it speaks to you in foreign languages if you need it. Uh, it can tell you that you put in your credit card upside down, but it doesn't tell you what the price is. Uh, that doesn't tell you until you touch any button and then it will tell you what is the price at that time. And here is the price at the time that I was looking at this, that the first hour was $3, and the second hour was $4. So it'll be $7 for, for two hours of parking. Which seemed like a lot to charge students uh, on, on campus. Well, let's look and see how it worked. Um, so I, many people probably think that professors have a lot of spare time on their hands. And, and, and I think it is true. Um, I set up my camera on a tripod across from eight uh, uh, curb parking spaces. These are diagonal rather than parallel. Uh, but that's about uh, what is the, the average number of parking spaces on a block in, in Los Angeles and in American cities. And I would say the price is just right. The, the almost all seven spaces are occupied and one is, is open, which is just what you want to see. And I think you could see somebody paying at the parking meter. So I, I uh, uh, took a picture every four minutes. You'll see the, the sudden uh, pattern on the, on the street move as the time goes on. Here's Four years, four minutes later, one car is left and another car is, uh, has arrived. And so there's still one curb parking space, which, which which you want. And I think there's somebody heading for the parking meter. Another four minutes later, you can see that somebody has arrived and somebody has left. But still, this is what you want to see. Now, there was a, a time when they were all occupied, but it didn't last long. And again, there was one space. Uh, sometimes there were two spaces. Uh, uh, but normally it's what you wanted to see. Uh, uh, 
once there are three Kerber spark parking spaces, it's never going to be uh, exactly right for all the time. Uh, there are four different price schedules during the day, but this is in, in, in the middle of the day. That's a library right behind. If somebody comes to the library and wants to, to, to uh, deliver a book, return a book or pick one up, they just they won't have to be here more than 20 minutes so they could uh, Pay, they could find an easy space. Before this was this pricing scheme went into effect, all the spaces were occupied all day long. And people kept driving around hunting for parking. So I think that um, that's the right price uh, for that place. Uh, should it be lower? Uh, I don't think so, because if it's, if it's um, uh, lower, then all the spaces would be full and drivers would have to cruise for parking. Uh, the cruising drivers will waste fuel that we import and pollute the air that we breathe and congest traffic that we travel in and it contribute to climate change, I suppose. Uh, should it be higher? I don't think it should be. They could, the, the, the university could earn more money. They could get more money by charging more. Um, but then the space, some of the spaces will be unused. Um, and so I think the price is right at this place. What other principle for setting prices can you recommend for setting the price of parking? What other what 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 other prices would you could anyone recommend? Uh, what principle would anybody recommend other than getting the the uh, the uh, uh, the results that you want? You can't tell whether the price is right without looking at the results. Um, it's the lowest price the city can charge without creating a shortage. Um, and do you think it should be lower than that? <laughs> well, I hope not. And do you think it should be higher than that? I hope not. It's the price is just right. Um, it'll have to vary by time of day and day of the week as they do uh, at UCLA. Now, uh, it's like an endless auction. Um, or a spot market in land. Uh, a spot market is the, the market for immediate delivery of oil or anything else. And uh, parking is the, is the uh, essential spot market, I think. And the, the, uh, the city should treat it that way. Now, this doesn't mean that all the curbs should be used for, for parking. Uh, there are a lot of other uses and many of them are more important. Uh, now, uh, at least in the United States, and I suspect elsewhere, uh, that we have much more uh, delivery from companies like Amazon. So we need loading zones. Uh, if there aren't uh, open spaces at the curb for loading zones, the delivery vehicles have to park at a curb in, in a traffic lane. Uh, and they, it's, they're double parking, um, which reduces the uh, road capacity. And for, uh, for Uber and Lyft and uh, the uh, drivers that pick up and drop off passengers, they have to pick up and drop off passengers in a traffic lane, which is unsafe. There was one uh, study by a student at UCLA who, who was an Uber driver who looked at uh, a, a, a busy street in West Hollywood in, Cal in Los Angeles. And the, uh, the, the, uh, one of the traffic lanes was blocked by an Uber uh, vehicle 40% of, of an hour, of every hour. Uh, so it was more dangerous to get in and out of cars in traffic and it, it, it congests traffic. And we need you know, bus stops and we need uh, bike lanes and, and bus lanes. There are a lot of uses of the curb, but if you're going to use it for parking, you want to charge the right price. Well, what is the most productive use of, of the curb lane? Here's a, a bike station on one side of the street in New York and three parked cars taking up the same space on the other side of the street. And when the city started uh, removing uh, parked cars and putting in bike stations, people complained, say, you're taking away our precious parking. Uh, but there, in, this, in this one hour video that there were 
200 people arrived or left out from the for the bike station and 11 from the uh, three parked cars. So if you had a restaurant or a short store or anything like that, wouldn't you rather have 200 people arriving or leaving rather than 11? Many merchants have a, a, a wildly overestimated idea of how many of their customers uh, come by car. Uh, that, uh, that they'll say 75% come by a car. When you actually interview people, it may be 10%. Uh, so I think that, uh, that we've devoted too much of our curb space, uh, of, of our city, uh, to cars. And a lot of that is for empty cars. Uh, that, uh, and they live rent free. Well, but still, it's very hard to convince people that we should charge the right price. You know, well, an academic could give a lecture like this, uh, but there is a, a terrific uh, opposition to paying for parking. Um, uh, that is the paid parking derangement syndrome. Um, there are other uh, derangement syndromes you've heard of, but this one is that the prospect of paying for parking just triggers incredible reactions. And in any public meeting about uh, parking, the uh, drivers are the loudest voices in the room, and they give the impression that everybody wants to park free, but actually only a small percentage of people can park free. But the, the, but the people who want to park free really want to park free. Um, it, 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 the reality show and, and on television in LA, yeah, uh, there was a people hunting for parking uh, were, were determined to get it for free. Uh, the Seinfeld show said paying for parking is like going to a prostitute. Why should I pay when if I apply myself, maybe I could get it for free. But we're all trying to get it for free. Um, and you should look at it from the prostitute's point of view. Uh, why serve you rather than someone else? That really we could let prices guide who parks where. So how do you overcome this uh, derangement syndrome? Well, I think, uh, and uh, other cities have found out, that if you establish parking benefit districts, uh, that's my second major reform, is to use the revenue to pay for public investment on the meter streets. Uh, and this use of this revenue should create political support for Goldilocks pricing. Um, and to show the benefits of spending media revenue on the blocks that generate it, I'll sh describe how this policy worked in practice in Pasadena. And it was almost like reconstruction. It was a skid row um, and very few people wanted to go there uh, now uh, 40 years ago. Um, and it didn't have any parking meters. Um, and people thought of parking meters like this cartoon, where does the money go? Uh, it doesn't seem to go anywhere good. Um, and that the urban planners like, like me, who recommend charging for parking seem uh, like devils. Um, uh, but when, when, the, when people know where the money is going, they understand what is the right price for parking. Here's a picture that was taken during the 1984 Olympics uh, in, in, in Los Angeles, uh, near the Los Angeles Coliseum. And this during the, the Olympics, people would uh, uh, put their own cars on the street and rent out their driveways and their backyards. And they would advertise $5, and that would be a lot more now, and waving a flag that Many people think that charging for parking is un-American, but I think it's very American uh, to charge people for what they use. Um, um, they know where the money is going. If, mm -hmm. if it's going to you, well, then the right price is, is, uh, is, is reasonable. So how did this apply in Pasadena, that they hired a, a consultant uh, to evaluate how this uh, this this uh, 
skid row, as we call it, they did in the United States, a slum, uh, could revive. They were wonderful buildings in terrible condition. Uh, and this is true of a lot of cities around the world that people who've been there re lately find it hard to believe that this was true. But the area was seedy and unkempt and unsafe. And the, 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 the main land uses were pawn shops and porn theaters and tattoo parlors. Nothing wrong with them, but that shouldn't be your only land use or your main land use. And here is old Pasadena now. What explains the change from a slum into one of the most popular places in Southern California? 30 or 40,000 people on a typical weekend come just to walk around and enjoy it. Well, it was parking meters with revenue return. Um, the uh, the uh, merchants and the uh, and the, the store owners, store owners of the uh, their employees parked at the curb uh, and complained about the fact that there was no place for their customers. Um, they moved their cars every two hours so they could get park free, and then they thought, well, why isn't there more parking for our customers? As the city wanted to put in parking meters, um, and, and everybody said, well, that'll drive away the few customers we have. Um, and they argued for two years until the city said, all right, if we put in these parking meters, we'll return all of the parking meter revenue to old Pasadena to pay for what you want. Uh, but they, they had a plan, but they had no way to pay for things. The, the sidewalks were in terrible condition. The street trees were dead. Uh, the alleys were filthy. When the city said we could spend the money on these items, everybody said, well, let's do it. Uh, that Let's do it right now. Uh, so they installed the 690 meters and they run until midnight and on Sunday. Uh, the merchant said, well, <laughs> yes, we want the meters to run <laughs> until midnight and on Sunday because we want the money. Um, and they yield uh, over a million dollars a year uh, for 15 blocks. Uh, so the, the business and property owners saw the parking mirrors in a new light as a source of, rev, of revenue. Um, and they converted the alleys into, into uh, beautiful walkways. Here is a quote from the uh, 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 business leader who was uh, a member of the uh, meters own advisory board. So it showed that there was a committee of people, property owners and residents and merchants say, what should we do with the money? Uh, and look at that last sentence. When we figured out that the money would stay here and that the money would be used to improve the amenities, it was an easy sell. Uh, how many times is this an easy sell to put in parking meters and you say you're gonna run them till midnight and on Sunday and you're gonna charge a high price? But they wanted it and they wanted it to happen right away. Um, and it led to big changes. Here is what it looked like beforehand. Uh, before the restoration and new street trees. Uh, here, the place was in terrible shape. Uh, it is very difficult to restore old buildings. It's a very expensive process. And it doesn't pay if, if, if it's a slum because the rent won't pay, won't, won't uh, uh, finance it. But once the city did what only the city could do, which is to build, put in entirely new sidewalks everywhere and new street trees everywhere um, and new tree grates uh, and added security, then things were better. Here was a, what had been a, an empty tire warehouse. It had been empty for 10 years and it became a department store with no new parking. Um, Here's a typical alley beforehand with dead animals and mattresses and things like that. They used the meter money to clean it up and to pave it with cobblestones and putting street trees. And now there are new uh, cafes there that they, all the stores now have two front doors and out and back is now a very desirable place to have uh, uh, restaurants. And remember, this was a commercial slum of 40 years ago.
So parking meters with revenue return contributed hugely to remaking old Pasadena. Uh, so I think that these parking benefit districts, which are spreading around the United States and, and in, in other countries as well, and in uh, Mexico and uh, India, uh, I don't know if any in Europe, but uh, it's a transportation management tool because the, uh, the charging the right price for curb parking uh, will reduce what everybody complains about, the traffic congestion. So the congestion caused by people driving who don't want to be driving, they want to be parked, but they create traffic congestion for everybody who does want to go somewhere. Um, and it's also an economic development tool because it pays for these uh, public services that are otherwise uh, uh, unaffordable. Uh, so it, 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 in, in the first five years after uh, Pasadena uh, started this, this policy, the sales tax revenue, which like, like value added tax, uh, it's a measure of economic activity. It tripled in the area. Many people think that parking meters or say that parking meters will, will harm business, but it using putting in parking meters and spending the money in, in, the, in the neighborhood uh, uh, will greatly improve business. Uh, it increases employment. Just think of all the people who, who, who make a living in old Pasadena, those restaurants and, and stores that were previously, all the buildings were empty above the first floor. So I think that uh, where will these work best, uh, these parking benefit districts? I think it's where curb parking is overcrowded. That's easy to see. Uh, and that's true in a lot of places. Um, and where public services are undersupplied, that is also true in many cities, uh, that uh, the sidewalks are dirty or broken up, uh, the street trees are dead, the, there's graffiti everywhere, uh, and uh, only a small minority of residents can park a car on the street. In any dense area, just geometry says that not many people can park a car on the street. Say in New York, they're typically, um, uh, 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 20 residents for every curb space. Um, so uh, only a tiny share of people will end up paying for parking. Uh, the, the, uh, if the, for every curb space, there, there, there are 19 people who don't own a car, uh, that 19 people, well, all 20 people will benefit from the public services, but only one person will pay for it. And that's why uh, politically a, it, it makes uh, a, a big difference. Um, people who cannot afford a car uh, uh, will get public services. Uh, people who choose not to own a car uh, will get public services. So these parking benefit districts, which uh, used, are what used to be called market socialism, where the socialism wasn't working well, they realized that, well, we really need prices, uh, uh, but the government should still own the uh, 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 means of production. Well, the city does own the curb lane, and it does use prices to manage the parking spaces, and it spends the revenue to provide public service. Um, uh, so I think that this is the ideal socialism of market socialism is that the government owns the, the, the means of production, all the land. It's the easiest thing to price. I think that the, the, the other kinds of socialism are hard to manage uh, because uh, the prices are not so obvious. Uh, so I think that uh, if the, the, the parking is free, uh, the the people who who, who use the land uh, uh, without paying anything, without benefiting anybody but themselves. So I think if if you, regardless of your uh, politics, I think that uh, the, the, the parking benefits were a good idea. And then you could get rid of minimum parking requirements, which I uh, don't have time to talk about, but I did said. Uh, a, uh, a short uh, uh, article about the, the damage done by parking requirements that they 
that the off-street parking requirements, uh, the cities have to require new buildings to have off-street parking because the curb parking is, is so crowded. It's obvious that we need off-street parking. But if we have on-street parking always available, we don't need to increase the number of off-street parking spaces, which really skew the land use and travel uses toward cars and the, the parking spaces themselves, whether they're parking lots or parking structures, they don't look good. And if everything, housing has to come with off-street parking, it makes it more expensive, it's harder to reuse older buildings because they don't have the required parking. Uh, and they damage the economy and they, they harm the environment. So I think if you want to reduce unnecessary vehicle travel, travel that people don't want to make, Nobody wants to cruise for parking. They want to park. And if you want to reduce traffic congestion and air pollution and energy waste and greenhouse gas emissions, if you want to improve neighborhood public services and reduce the, the, the cost and increase the supply of housing and do it quickly, then I think that these are the three things that I recommend and get the price of curb parking right, um, spend the revenue for local public services, and remove all street parking requirements. I think that we're realizing that we've made epic mistakes in parking. Uh, we have uh, 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 chosen all the wrong policies to keep the curb parking free and then uh, require all street parking that spreads everything out, increases the expense of everything. It makes driving the obvious way to get anywhere. So I think that that regardless of your politics, there are good reasons to support the uh, 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 curb parking, uh, whether you're on, on the left or on the right. There's something that, that they can agree on that this is what we ought to do. Um, I think uh, all parking is political um, and the prospects for parking reform depend on what the political context allows. So and I think diverse interests from across the political spectrum can, for different reasons, support a shift from minimum parking requirements to um, uh, performance parking prices. And liberals will see, there are progressives see, well, it increases public spending. Um, and the conservatives will see that it, it, it uses markets um, and it, it gets rid of government regulation. It doesn't tell you how long you should park. It doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you anything except what is the price of parking. And environmentalists have a lot to gain from uh, parking benefit districts with the right price per curb parking. It, 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 it solves a lot of problems that environmentalists are or reduces a lot of problems that environmentalists are concerned with. And businesses have a lot to benefit from this because it takes a, a burden off the businesses in, in parking requirements that they'll let you, you open a business without off-street parking. And what we call new urbanists in the United States, uh, they are people who think we are, that cities should begin looking like old or cities look like. They should look more like Paris than like Los Angeles. Um, and libertarians, uh, or a lot of them and around the world, they, they want to be left alone. They don't want the government telling them what to do. And people who believe that they, they should be able to do what they want with their property uh, have a lot to gain. And people who build uh, will see that it, it reduces the cost of, of building. And the residents will see huge improvements, as I showed in Pasadena. Um, and uh, people who are worried about the high price of, of, of housing will see it reduces the cost of building housing. And people who want to have uh, neighborhood power, the, the neighborhood ought to uh, uh, have more say about what they do. And that I think the biggest beneficiaries will be local elected officials. Um, they won't have to deal with the part paid parking derangement syndrome. They won't have to have endless meetings dealing with parking that, and that pretend that they know what uh, are interested in parking. They just want the meeting to end. Uh, and often they end by choosing some bad idea. 
what will we do with all the cars that we don't need? Here's a sculpture in France called long-term parking. Uh, what about all the, uh, the, the huge parking structures that we've built? What will we do with them? Um, well, here's a better idea, I think, for using them. The universities should do this with theirs. Um, I think that you've probably all heard of Abraham Lincoln, who is the greatest writer among all our presidents. Um, and I think that our case is new, and it's time to think of new about parking and to act to new. Um, and despite all of the institutional in inertia in urban planning and the, the outrageousness of charging for curb parking, reforms are sprouting. Um, the paradigm shifts in urban planning are often barely noticeable while they're happening. And afterward, it's hard to tell that anything has changed, that we make such U-turns uh, that we don't remember we were going in another direction. Uh, but I, I, th I think the parking problem will always be with us unless General Motors succeeds with one promising strategy that it's working on now. And if this technology pans out, it can restore the leadership of the American automobile industry. Um, here it is. Well, until we do that, I think it would depend on urban planners to solve the problem. Um, well, parking is free for cars, but housing is expensive for people. And we have our priorities exactly the wrong way around. Cities have made epic mistakes in planning for parking, and you can help to correct it. Well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to hearing your, your comments and, and your questions. Many thanks for this, uh, Donald. I think it's a very eloquent uh, case that uh, we have to introduce uh, introduce flexible pricing and uh, we have to, to think of op optimization in terms of usage and so on and so forth. Uh, I have a couple of other questions, but first I just want to, to ask uh, the ones that have been asked by the, by the audience. So one question is um, uh, related to mobile apps. Are cities considering uh, parking, pricing or usage using mobile apps rather than smart meters? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'm sure that, that every technology in parking uh, will be obsolete five years from now. I think that the parking meters were inv invented in 1935. Uh, the first one was installed in Oklahoma City. Uh, and many parking meters are now are almost identical. Um, you, you put your money in and you, you hope to get back before your time runs out. Um, that they were initially criticized as a, an infernal combination between a, uh, of a, a slot machine and an alarm clock. Mm -hmm. uh, so you take a chance. So now I think with uh, mobile uh, payments for parking, which are, are, are spreading in, in some places, that's the only way you could pay for parking is with uh, your cell phone, is that uh, your cell phone knows where it is and it knows what the price of parking is in that location because that's on the web. And when you get to your location, you simply uh, uh, start the paying for parking. And when your car pulls away, it stops paying for parking. So you pay only for the exact amount of time that you're parked. Um, and in some German cars now, the, uh, the app has uh, moved into the car's dashboard that the car is, is connected. Um, uh, just as your cell phone is. And uh, when you pull into a parking space, you just uh, touch a, a button on your dashboard and it begins paying for parking. And when you pull out, it, you stop paying for parking. And it's also combined uh, with uh, uh, apps that show you what is the price of parking everywhere and what are the occupancy okay. rate. Mm -hmm. So the, the car, you, you, you could tell the car or your t t cell phone where you're going and it will give you, as you have now, uh, direction, turn by turn instructions, but it takes you right to the parking space. Um, and if you say you're willing to walk because to save money, it will take you to a parking space farther away. If you're in a hurry and you're willing to pay, it'll take you to a parking space close to where you want to park. So I think that 
cars were learned how to pay for parking far, far uh, sooner than the cars will learn how to drive themselves. Mm. Um, uh, so I think that, yes, your question is right, that the, the parking meters that I showed, they're still around. And uh, people don't like change, <laughs> including uh, changes in, in how you pay for parking. But uh, so it's, in some cities, and I'd recommend this in, in Ukraine, to make these, these this, uh, pay by license plate, it's called, or the, the, the cell phone knows your license plate, and your license plate pays for parking. Um, that if you if you if you're paying for parking, your license plate shows all the city's um, uh, uh, system that that car is paying for parking. But in some cities, the if you're a res if your car is registered in that city, you pay less than uh, a, a a car that's not registered in the city. Say in, in tourist areas like Miami Beach. The uh, the a non-resident when well, they look at their app, they, it's four dollars an hour for parking. But they feel lucky; they can find a space right wherever they are. But if your if your license plate is is registered Miami Beach, you only pay one dollar an hour. So it's 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 like Monty Python's idea to solve Britain's economic problem by taxing foreigners living abroad. And I think that uh, yes, the the questioner is right that 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 uh, it's easy to explain this policy by showing old-fashioned parking meters. Uh, but in the future, uh, many cities have, have, have jumped straight forward from no uh, uh, charging for parking to paying only by uh, parking meters. So there's no uh, physical infrastructure. There's no, um, you avoid an immense amount of cost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this leads to the second question because Julia is asking, what about cities that don't have the resources to pay for smart meters, which presumably are not a cheap piece of infrastructure? Uh, but I think you're just, yeah, you you've just mentioned this. Yes, that's right. And I, 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 but I think it is still a problem because the city would have to set up, they have to contract with the private operator. You know, the cities don't run these apps. It, it, it's, it's private companies run the apps. And they could start by the same, but they would have to have signage. Uh, they would have to have, uh, the cities would have to do the enforcement. Uh, uh, but uh, what the original parking meters were in 1935, uh, nobody knew what they were even. Uh, they seemed outrageous. But the parking meter companies themselves paid for the installation. And they took the revenue until the uh, payment, the, the installation cost was uh, recovered. And then the city got all the money. It usually took about six months for the, uh, the city paid nothing. Uh, and it got no revenue, but after six months, it paid nothing and it got all the revenue. Mm -hmm. And they also did uh, a clever thing. They would put parking meters in on one side of the street, but not the other. So people could see how the parking meters work. And almost always, as soon as the meters went in on one side, the merchants on the other side said, we want parking meters. I see. This is one of sec This is the second question that Yulia was asking: Is how do you make the transition from no, no payment to some payment? Uh, and you, what you do, you basically described is a, is a competition for these resources. But for that to work, you must really link the the parking to revenue uh, of that street or of that block. Uh, yes, I think you rely on the 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 the. the uh the uh, apps for now for using cell phones that uh, say, I think VW has bought one of the major uh, pay by cell phone apps. Sure. And, uh, and it's a very competitive industry, but I think, and it, it costs money that uh, some cities, uh, so that the app puts a surcharge on usually 30 cents for a uh, for each parking session, uh, that if you if you if you pay two dollars for parking, the city gets two dollars. <laughs> you have to pay thirty cents to the app company because uh, they they're doing a lot of work. Uh, uh, but the cities can absorb that thirty cents, and they 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 get instead of getting two dollars an hour, they for an hour of parking, they get a dollar seventy. 
but I think that, uh, yes, it is difficult for uh, a, especially in reconstruction, whether you want to spend your money on, on, on reconstructing, not on charging for parking, that I'm sure that the um, VW or, or uh, pay by cell or pay by phone or Ringo, or, they're companies in Britain and the United States and Holland and, and Germany and France that have, they're all competing. And I think that the competition is good in, in, in this market. We have another question which asks primarily about the interaction between private and public uh, uh, parking uh, payment strategies. Uh, because what you've described is something that links very much to, to this, uh, a particular district, a particular uh, municipality, uh, but, and primarily discusses curb parking. Uh, how, how do things change or what are, if, if, if any, are there any, any qualitative changes once we take into account also private parking? So that, well, yes, know, yeah. yeah, yes. Most of the parking is off street, and the, oh. the, the off street, some of which is public off street, and some which is private off street. Most of it is private off street. Uh, but in San Francisco, when they they have, uh, uh, I think, twenty seven thousand parking meters, and they have uh, eighteen uh, parking structures, uh, which have more parking, uh, and they have the same pricing policy. Hours okay. that the price is, is high, uh, and, and where the demand is high, the price is high. And, and, and late at night, when there's very low demand, the price is very low. The, 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 that off-street parking can be priced in exactly the same way. And, and, and as well, the, the parking prices went down in, in off-street parking. Many off-street parking garages, you could look at them, they're not full. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, the, the price should be lower. Uh, so, but I think that the uh, many of the off-street uh, parking garages are now uh, paying by uh, pay on foot, that they call it. That uh, that they uh, you you go to a meter in the garage and you pay for the parking there. It's it it it'll, it'll be. Uh, there, yes, say in Century City, next to near where I, I, I live, right near UCLA, and there's near a, a, a big shopping center called Century City. The people want touchless parking, oh. and the when you drive into the garage, it sees your parking uh, plate, and if you're registered with the with the garage, it starts charging you for parking. And when you lease the garage, the, the gate just goes up. Uh, as you go in and you go out, the gate just goes up because it recognizes your license plate and it charges you your credit card for what you what what for the parking you're using. So I think that that parking will become much more like other things, like a telephone call. Uh, or that uh, you, you know, if I were going to use my cell phone to to call you in Ukraine, I would pay a lot of money because it's a long way away. So the charge for a bit, it would be high. Uh, and uh, depending on the length of time I talk, it'll be more like charges for telephone calls. Mm -hmm. I have a question on pricing. Uh, you know, you're mentioning, should it be higher, should it be lower than the price that gives you 85% occupancy? Um, does it make sense to link perhaps the price to encouraging or discouraging use of cars, encouraging of public transportation? So, you know, in a sense, to think of a, a broader objective, which is that not only of reducing uh, congestion and so on and so forth, which, you know, in this setting makes perfect sense, but to think of an overall lower usage of cars. So to say, perhaps with a higher price, we are discouraging some of those who are just marginally there to take the bus, for example. Well, uh, that's... I, I don't think so. I think that the the, uh, the the curb parking prices will themselves do the work of encouraging people to take transit. Uh, the charging the right price of we're we're so underpriced right now. We're so far away from the right price that we should start. Uh, you could explain it to people what eighty five percent occupancy is oh. easy to understand. Well, what is the right price to encourage transit use? What I do think is that if we start charging for curb parking, 
that they will show us. I showed that, that back bike station um, uh, In video York. that it, it's, it, it, it reveals that the curb is very unproductive when it's used for, for, for empty cars. Uh, rather than moving bicycles. And mm -hmm. it, it shows how you can uh, have a curb lane that is for, for buses only. It, it'll show that the, that the uh, revenue from the curb spaces uh, may be far less than the value of having a curb lane, uh, uh, express, uh, express lane for buses only, or for uh, bicycles only. I think that it's very difficult to have effective bicycle lanes and bus lanes now because the, the objections of people who park free. <laughs> uh, so, and I think if you do have a bus lane on one side of the street, well, the people who park can park on the other side of the street. The price of parking will be higher uh, because there'll be fewer parking spaces, but maybe more people will be riding the bus. So I, I, let me put it this way, that I would, if, if, if it, if you need the buy-in from the public transit people, you can say one of the uses of the revenue is to pay for public transit passes for everybody on the meter street. Say Boulder, Colorado does this, that they, uh, they use the meter money and everybody who works or lives in downtown Boulder gets a free transit pass. Now that's much more effective than giving the money to the transit agency. Uh, which is another black hole. Uh, it's a demand side subsidy for transit, not a supply side subsidy for transit. And it shows these people they're getting something that if you were on a block and they and lived on a block where they said, well, we're going to start charging for parking, giving the money to the transit agency, would you be in favor of that? Well, I think you'd be in favor of more if they said we're going to charge for parking, give you and everybody else a transit pass. Many thanks for inciting this clarif clarification of demand uh, subsidy versus supply subsidy in, in public transportation is an extremely important distinction that sometimes gets, just gets, gets washed away in, in, in the discourse um, and how this interacts with, with uh, with parking is is also not a trivial uh, thing. Uh, Donald, many thanks for for taking the time. Many thanks for your presentation and and comments. Uh, I hope to be able to welcome you once we start our master's program as an invited speaker at some point. I think many many of the lessons that that you're describing uh, for the U.S. are extremely relevant also for uh, for Ukraine. Uh, as mentioned, you know congestion and. Uh, cruising for parking and so on. All of these problems are there, even though the cities have been built uh, uh, on, on different continents in different times and so on and so forth. This reliance on, on car for transportation eventually gets us the same problems. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, all of us in the rest of the world feel so helpless in, in when we see the uh, aggression against Ukraine. and. Uh, we could give money for 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 uh, uh, food subsidies and things like that, but it's it's wonderful to be able to make a connection actually to you. And if you and if you have questions, you could write to me. And if you're on Facebook, there's a uh, there's a group, well, several groups that are uh, focused on parking, but there's one that's focused on these ideas called the Shupistas. Uh, it, it sounds left wing, it, it's, it's like Sandinistas or some rebellious group, uh, but there are people who are interested in, in the ideas that we've been talking about today. So thanks again and farewell. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Have a nice day still. Bye bye.